there was a bright, brilliant white figure reflected in the windshield of the car. And I had the assurance that everything was going to be all right. He said, I'm going to be with you for a long time. I've, I've known you all your life, and I've been your guardian angel all your life. I looked back up, and the face was still there. And it was, it was a warm feeling that the, the eyes were giving me. And instead of being frightened, I knew it was, it was okay. The angel who was present in my room touched me. And that made all the difference. At that moment, I just felt peace. And the thoughts quit going through my head all at once. And it was just one of the most wonderful feelings I've ever had. Angels don't want the attention on them. They want us focused beyond them. And it's that angelic presence that binds us into one another's lives. Then we become so much more open to each other. Yes, I do. I definitely do. Well, sure. I mean, uh, you know, what else? Sure, I believe in them. I gotta believe something's looking out for me. Yes, I do. Yes. Sure, I believe in them. No, I don't. If it had not been for Angel, I wouldn't even be alive today. During the time my father was ill in the hospital, she appeared to me and stayed with me the entire time he was ill. And the day he died, she disappeared. There's been too many times in my past, or possibly in your own past, where, very frankly, you've made it out of some scrapes. Somebody had to have been watching over you. I've been at crossroads in my life or, or in danger, and, uh, and they've just been there to protect me. They're sort of like, messengers and they may even carry secrets of the innermost part of the heart. It's a little bit like believing in ghosts, I guess. I just never seen one, never uh, met one, so I have no other way to believe in them. For an example, my dad, uh, when I was 11 years old, he was in an accident. Uh, he had a, an extensive brain injury. He stayed unconscious for a little over a year in Phoenix, Arizona in the hospital. But he says when he woke up, there was an angel that was at the foot of his bed. And the thing about it is when he woke up, he had been laying there and they had been rolling him in sheets to keep down bed sores and what have you. And he had lost weight. He was just a skeleton, you might say. And that day, he got up out of that bed and walked to the bathroom by himself. My name is Pam Kidd. While doing research for my magazine assignment on the subject of angels, I came to one undeniable conclusion. Angel believers are all around. In fact, a recent Time magazine poll announced that 69% of Americans believe that angels exist. And 46% of the population are convinced that they have their own guardian angel. So is this some sort of new age fad? This year it's angels, next year who knows? Well, actually, if you take a look at the big picture, angels have been a part of people's lives in every age across the planet. And respected authorities like John Rahner, author of two best-selling angel books, have discovered something through extensive research. In 1990, there was a Gallup poll showing that 13% um, of respondents felt that they had encountered a, an angel or some other supernatural being. That's a lot of people there. That's over 30 million people if you extrapolate that out to the population. Six times the, the population in my home state of Tennessee. Um, and many polls just like this. The thing that is intriguing about this is the polls are unanimous. They don't deviate one from the other. They all indicate that a substantial minority of us are having these experiences. And if we go back just 150 years in our culture, it was perfectly okay to talk about these things. Our great-grandparents knew about this kind of thing very well and would talk about this and uh, families would discuss uh, visitations with the deceased and what happened to grandpa on his deathbed and how he said that he saw a light and saw grandma coming to him in those last few moments and so on. Then we went through a period, I suppose, into this century where it just became 
uh, not so respectable to talk about these things and they were dismissed and, and people thought that these were old wives tales and superstitions. Uh, I think what's happening rather than it being a fad is that we are reconnecting with, with a critical part of ourselves that we have been cut off from in Western civilization. We interpret it to be a discovery. Well, it's really not. It's a rediscovery. These things are part and parcel of being a human being. And uh, people have had spiritual experiences as long as there have been people. Like most issues of faith, believing that a supreme being has devised this marvelous scheme that shadows each of us with a caring sponsor, patron, messenger, guide, whatever you might call your angel, it's something you have to simply believe. A short run through history can't help but reinforce and refresh the angel believer's confidence on the subject. From the beginning, artist's brush and sculptor's chisel were expressing this age-old angel notion. If you doubt their prevalence, look around. Try conducting your own angel search when my husband and I had a chance to visit several countries a few years ago, I used my camera for a private angel hunt. I found them on fountains, atop street signs, on the facades of public buildings, on the doorposts of private homes, angels everywhere. Remarkable the lengths we go to depict angels when so few of us have seen angels face to face. Or is it really that rare are there people alive today who have actually looked into the eye of an angel? Steve Hooper, suffering from a severe and painful blood disorder, awoke one night to an unexpected visitor. The room was just filled with the light, the brightest, whitest light I've ever seen in my life. And at the foot of the bed was a figure. Uh, it was a man, had uh, shoulder length hair, I could not make out any of the features of the face, but the, uh, the, the warmth filled the room, the love filled the room, it filled my body. I could just feel it uh, all through me, working all through me. I could actually see the wings, it, they were folded against the back and stood about uh, a foot above the top of his head. He, the only thing he spoke to me was, I am the angel of mercy. The next morning I asked my wife, did you see her or hear anything strange in the middle of the night? And she says, no. Uh, did the dog wake you again? I said, no. She seemed to be okay, but did you see or feel or hear anything besides that? She said she hadn't. I said, don't worry about my iron test coming up next month. I know it's gonna be okay. I've had the reassurance that everything is fine. And it was. Steve's next blood test came back normal, which according to his doctor was a near miracle. Officer Randy Salazar found himself in a terrible moral dilemma. A situation where the lives of an entire room full of innocent people depended on what he did next. The doctor said take the handcuffs off the prisoner. And I told the doctor, I said, he's, I'm gonna have problems with this guy, he's very combative, I don't, I don't want to. He says, I'm the doctor, you take the handcuffs off. I said, okay, so I took the handcuffs off this man. The doctor was examining him, and then he went through a, a series of questions to see how coherent he was. Uh, one of the questions was, what is today? And the prisoner said, today is uh, Monday. And right then, I looked in the prisoner's eyes, and I said, and today is the day I kill you. But I said it in my mind. I didn't say it where you could hear it. And I'm wondering, why did I say that? Then uh, uh, later on, the, my partner arrived, and we're, uh, we're there on the prisoner, and he's being very combative. And then my partner and I heard a, a tray of, of dishes or something fall down the hallway, and we, we turned our faces to, to look to see what it was. And at that point, the prisoner jumped off the gurney and grabbed my partner around the waist. And at first I didn't think he saw his gun that he had stuck in his belt. But he felt the gun and he pulled the gun out. I had no alternative to pull my weapon. And uh, I, as soon as my, my partner and the prisoner fell to the floor, 
uh, I saw the, the gun pointing straight towards my, my partner's chest. And I, I told Bob Russell, I said, Bob, get out of the way. And I fired one shot into the abdomen of the prisoner. Uh, he fell back uh, with a gun in his hand. And uh, much to my amazement, he sat back up still, and he pointed the gun at me. And I stepped one step over to get out of the way, but there's, remember, there's other people in this room. And I'm thinking, if, if he gets a shot off, he's going to kill somebody. At that point, uh, I stood back and uh, cocked the hammer back on my weapon. And this image appeared on the wall and stated in a clear voice, aim dead center, that way you'll hit something if you miss a little bit. So I, I pointed my gun and I shot the man right through the, shot him through the heart. After the shooting, Salazar naturally was in agony over what had happened. He went to his mother's and his father's house to try to get some sort of comfort. And I stepped out and I took a few steps towards their walkway that led up to the front door. Um, I noticed uh, something out of the corner of my eye. And uh, at first I thought it was a, a, a light, like a fluorescent light, which was above the, uh, the fence. And above this fence that was that's seven to eight feet high, there was a face. Uh, there was this, this face that was, that was looking at me. Very distinct, the eyes, nose, mouth, and everything. Very pleasant, and it was just looking at me. And as I walked slowly towards the door, the eyes of this face followed me. And I, I you know, blinked, and, and, and I stopped two-thirds of the way up to see if I was just, you know, thinking this in my mind. And it, it could not have been a person standing behind that fence because the face itself, from the chin to the top of the head, was at least 18 to 20 inches. So it was a very large face. But it was, like I said, it, it, it emanated a warm feeling. And it's like, uh, like your mother embracing you, holding you and saying, it, it's gonna be okay. <sighs> Everything's okay. A few days later, when I was looking through the Bible, I'd come across a passage in the Bible which says, he who sees the face of God will be saved. My oldest daughter, Sarah, had a visit from her guardian angel. This all started about a year ago when we had a, a break-in in our home. And Sarah was home from school, so uh, she was home alone when the intruders came in. When I found Sarah, she was uh, hog-tied. She was tied her hands to her feet, and she appeared to have amnesia. This amnesia just left me Without anything, I lost my life. And I didn't feel like I had anything to live for because I didn't even get to remember the experience that I had. It was really kind of sad, you know. I didn't know what to expect, you know, when I went over to see her that night. Before this accident, we had grown kind of apart. We hadn't really talked much anymore. And after this, she just became my closest friend. She'd come over, she would help me learn again, she would help me with my math and writing um, because I had to relearn those things all over again. One month after the crime was committed, Sarah fell down and had what appeared to be a seizure. It looked like a, a grandma type seizure. Sarah had been diagnosed as suffering from dissociative amnesia a form of post-traumatic stress disorder. And it was during the subsequent seizures that the terrifying details of the crime returned to Sarah's memory. I saw um, some pant legs and feet or someone was standing there and they were holding a crowbar trying to open my window. The people came up on the roof and they, they took a crowbar and hit the window frame to cause these cam locks to fall. I became completely hysterical. I tried to dial my mom's work. The line was busy, so I tried to run downstairs and see if there was any keys in the house. And my sister had taken the last set. So I was dead bolted in, and I figured the only other thing I could do is go upstairs in my parents' room because uh, they had some loaded guns, and if it came to that, that's all I would have. When I got to the hallway upstairs, I noticed I didn't hear anything else. I didn't hear any footsteps or noises or talking. And I figured that they had seen me run down the stairs and they left. I went to go look out the window 
to see if I could see a car leaving or something. And that's when two guys jumped out of my closet. The bigger one that seemed to be in charge grabbed a pillow, put the pillow on my head in order to smother me. Uh, I did get out from under the pillow at that point, and when my head moved back, uh, I saw that the bigger guy had a tattoo on his arm. When he realized that I did see that tattoo, he became enraged and um, he hit me in the head and I fell over. And um, that's the point when I died. After I left my body, I found myself waking up underneath a tree and uh, in a place that seemed to be the best place that anybody could ever be. This is the place I call heaven. This is the place that I would definitely want to spend eternity. Um, as I began to look around, I saw a figure approaching me, and it turned out to be a good friend of mine. Um, and uh, he had passed away four days before. Ryan walked up to me and um, simply explained to me what was happening to me and he said I was going to be okay and I was going to be spared for a certain reason. I had something to do. And um, he said he had someone to introduce to me. Shortly after, someone else walked up and uh, when we got closer, it was a tall man in a white suit and a white top hat who spoke with a British accent and um, he said, I'm going to be with you for a long time. I've, I've known you all your life and I've been your guardian angel all of your life. Uh, he said he didn't want me to be afraid because what was happening to me would be okay because I wasn't going to, I wasn't dying. I was going to, I would have to go back. And then he told me I was brought there to rest and to gain the courage and energy to go on and finish what I was supposed to finish. Uh, it seemed like everything started to kind of fade out and then I was back in my room before I knew it. When I woke up again, my dog was licking me on the face and I didn't know where I was or who I was or how I got there and why I was tied up. I saw the phone cord running right across my face. It was sitting up on the bed and I was on the floor. I pulled the cord with my teeth and the phone fell on the floor and it got knocked off the hook so I could use it. I pressed to redial because I figured maybe somebody knew me and before I could panic I needed to get some help. When I pressed to redial it dialed my mom's work because that's who I called before um, the people came in. My mom's boss answered and, and she talked to me, tried to figure out who I was and she couldn't tell so she got on the loudspeaker and told all her employees that there was a kid on the phone who was in a pink bedroom tied up and there was a lot of teddy bears around. My mom knew that was my room, so she raced home. Something occurred while in the presence of the psychologist who had been making regular visits to Sarah's home to help her regain her memory. My psychologist, um, she was trying to calm me down because nobody else really could. Um, I was to the point where I wasn't even listening to anybody. I was just rocking back and forth and trying to sing to myself. Um, while I was talking to her, a light appeared, and it appeared as a circular shape, and then it came down to be a long oval, and, uh, that was, that was George, and, um, immediately I just stopped crying, and Sharon just seemed amazed, uh, she said, well, how come you calmed down so quickly, and I said, well, he says I'm going to be okay. He's going to take care of me now. Sarah's guardian angel, who became fondly known in the Powell's home as George, helped in Sarah's emotional healing 
and reached out to touch the lives of her family and friends. In the next few minutes, I was laughing. I uh, just completely forgotten about any worries that I had. And in the next few minutes, he says, you need to take care of your sister. She's amazed and very upset by what happened to you. Um, I said, okay, I came downstairs and she was almost as bad off as I was before. So he had come down there with her, I guess, so, and um, she sat over on this coffee table in our living room and um, she, she just kind of looked at me and I looked over at her, but I didn't stop crying. It just made me worse think, looking at her. And um, she told me to put my hand over on a certain place on the couch. Didn't know why, but I did it. And um, at that moment, I just felt peace and the thoughts quit going through my head all at once. And it was just one of the most wonderful feelings I've ever had. And she, so she just looked at my mom. And I, I'm sure my mom was puzzled. My mother looked at me uh, as if to be in question. And um, she, I told her to sit down. And I said, uh, I have an angel and he's gonna be with me for a while. He's gonna help us get through this. And she just said, well, okay. <laughs> and I said, he says, um, he says he's been with me for a long time since I was a baby. And, um, and then I started laughing and she said, why are you laughing? And I said, well, he says that when I was a, a little kid, I used to laugh at him because he had this big hat that he always had to push out of his eyes and um, she started to cry. And Mark and I looked at each other and I started crying because there was a time in, when she was two and three years old when she would laugh a lot and we'd peek in her room and say, what are you laughing at? And she'd say, um, the man with the big hat comes and makes me laugh all the time and she would draw pictures of him. And um, we were just floored by it. We, you know, we. Then I begin to think, something, well, something's really going on here. I think we've probably always known intellectually that children have an innate spirituality, but, but I don't think that it's become anything really concrete. At least it certainly wasn't for me. Until recently when I began getting these letters and I, I was just in awe of what was being described here. And that's how I began to hear stories about imaginary friends. Now, pediatricians have known for years that children create these things. Um, they need a friend because they're lonely, because their older brothers and sisters have gone to school, and so they'll have somebody named Margie who will come and sit at the dinner table with them or something. And everyone kind of uh, patiently pats them on the head and, and thinks, well, this will be over soon, as soon as they get older. It will be over soon, but I think that the Margies might actually be angels that are with them for a time. And then as that veil between heaven and earth begins to descend farther and farther down, and children get older and move farther and farther away from their heavenly roots, they don't see these things anymore. They were bringing something of heaven to earth for a short period. George's desire to heal did not limit itself to Sarah. Debbie and Sarah and Helen came over um, after George had appeared to Sarah. And uh, we were sitting around the kitchen table visiting and it was just kind of an awesome experience to begin with because we would talk to Sarah and ask her questions and of George and, and George would respond and it was just, um, it, uh, it was really an exciting period anyway, or time or event, but when uh, we were sitting there at the table, Sarah, you could tell she was listening to George and she kind of looked off and she kind of nodded her head and she said, Annie, come here. And they got up and left the table and went into Annie's room and closed the door. She had done so much for me and I had asked her, is there anything that I can possibly do to let you know how much I appreciate you? 
that. She said, is it possible that you could heal me of my sickness? She's constantly sick all the time, man. With allergies, and she's had pneumonia a couple of times, and um, asthma, just everything you can name. The uh, last two years, she seemed to have gotten worse as far as the fatigue goes, and was actually on homebound through school. She couldn't even make it at school. Um, and this lasted for about a year and a half. She would be sick with bronchitis. She'd be well for about a week or so. Not well, but she wouldn't have the bronchitis. So she would still be extremely tired. And uh, I called George into her room. And we just sat and talked for a while just to get her comfortable with him. Uh, and George said, um, tell her to put her hand beside her. And she did, and he put his hand on, on hers. And I said, let's just pray, and we did. Sarah told me everything he was going to do, you know, then just relax, and he did it. And he just, you know, put his hand on me. I don't know what he did or, you know, what he said or how he did it, but, you know, all I know is he put his hand on me, and then it became better very quickly. The uh, homebound teachers that had worked with her, it's just like, well, um, especially one in particular, uh, Myra, she had tears in her eyes and just this, what, what happened? I mean, you know, this is just wonderful. She's doing so great. And I could just look at her with tears in my eyes and say it's been a miracle because it, it has been. It's been a, an incredible miracle. When Sarah was fully recovered, George prepared her for his departure. George said, well, since you're awake, um, why don't you come in here and bring some paper and a pencil? I said, okay, I will. And uh, I thought we were going to play a game. <laughs> and so I went into another room, brought my paper and pencil, and he told me to write down everything that he said. You must see that everyone within your reach hears about what happened to you, all of it. You must open their eyes and give them hope. Dedicate your soul to healing people Sim simply by talking and letting everyone know how the world is changing. You'll begin to get responses, ideas will come, solutions to problems will appear, and the people will send you letters suggesting and supporting you. Some people will be negative, but these are the people that are harder to reach. Don't let them discourage you. You have proven to be strong and your family as well. I know you can get through this, and when you do, it'll come out even more strong than before. You're the mouth that they will hear because you are a child, a child of God and a child who can bring hope to God's people. Please stay peaceful and one with God. I have to thank him as I have to thank God that he uh, did for Sarah so many things that for a time I could not do. And she told me George was gone and I was it was like a death of of somebody in the immediate family. It was it was like the death of, of somebody that I had been close to all my life. And I didn't know whether I was feeling all the pain for Sarah and thinking how she must feel just devastated and or whether it was just my own, you know, self missing, missing his presence and, and uh, knowing that he wouldn't be around the same way anymore. I think everybody has their own personal guardian angel. And it's really amazing to think that there's somebody just for me, somebody that God sent just for me. And uh, that's what I always think if I ever fell down. A noticeable side effect in those whose lives have been touched by an angel is a profound change in their sense of priorities. I just feel like Sarah's had a glimpse of something the rest of us haven't. And so it's, it's changed the way she looks at everything and everybody. She sees what's really important. Faith is the one thing that people should have and you can't just get faith by seeing something and then believing it. You have to 
uh, you have to have doubts first and then come through and you have to learn by other things and trust is another part of faith. Uh, just like the Bible, you have to believe you have to believe the Word of God. You can't go up to him and say, well, how do I know this is true? What are you going to, what are you going to give me? What are you going to show me? This is a world now that people have to receive something before they believe anything. Everything revolves around what you're going to get before you give anything. And um, I think it should be the other way around. We want to be happy doing things together, not gaining things together. You know, it's not the house, it's not the car. Uh, money, but it's how many wonderful good times can we have together. We're not here simply to to see, you know, see how many dollars we can make. He who dies with the most toys wins. Uh, we're not to be like the Pharaohs, you know, amassing treasures and then burying it all with ourselves. There's something more to this life. This one philosopher said, there's a God-shaped hole in each of us and it can only be filled with God. And what happens is, I think, um, we try to fill it with a lot of other things. Uh, we've had um, decades, you know, maybe from the early 60s when we took God out of everything. He, we didn't need Him in our schools anymore. We weren't going to pray to Him in public. God was reserved for Sunday mornings, you know, if you wanted to even make the effort. And uh, we were a stalwart people. We were, we were a proud people. We didn't need to be on our knees. And that evolved into a culture of drugs that was where we were going to find our God and immorality and then that that went into a culture of the me generation and then that kind of went into a culture of materialism and acquiring things and through all of this our hearts have become more and more empty that God-shaped hole that we've tried to fill with all these other things has become more and more wounded it's really no accident that materialism is on the wane uh, that the leading thinkers, the movers, the intellectual movers and shakers of our culture are changing their minds in mass um, and coming around to the idea that we don't live in a big machine that's cold and has no connection with us, but we do live in a spiritual universe. It's happening because there are developments coming out of science itself. You have the anthropic principle, which uh, indicates to us that we live in a universe uh, that appears to have been designed uh, by an invisible hand, uh, a universe that has resulted in us being here against incredible odds. You have the Gaia hypothesis, which indicates that the, that the very planet that we live on and, and all of its functioning systems that keep us alive are here against incredible odds. Uh, you have quantum physics, which, which shows us that our basic reality, the reality that our world is based on, down there at that little subatomic level, is a never-never is a land, a place where consciousness shapes reality and determines it. Where reality is not, where, the, where matter is not supreme. Indeed, matter in a very real sense has no existence apart from consciousness, apart from the observer looking at it. Quantum physics, alternate reality, pretty difficult concepts for some of us to grasp. But there are stories too of angels taking human form and others of humans who seem to somehow be promoted to angel status for a brief period. John Griffith, suffering from a case of angina, was instructed by his doctor to be tested by a cardiologist. And uh, he came out from the angiogram with a very uh, somber expression on his face and he said, uh, I have some news for you that uh, you're not going to like to hear. He says, you have five blockages in your arteries and he said, and you have an aneurysm in the aorta. And he said, you're not to leave the hospital until we have surgery. The surgery didn't go as well as expected. <clears throat> I was supposed to be out in three to five days, and uh, I saw three roommates that passed uh, through my room before I was able to leave. And I continued to have, uh, have problems, uh, blood clots and a feeling of uh, total disorientation. And I just, just things just weren't right. And uh, the doctor said, we're going to have to keep testing and find out what's wrong. Over the next 18 months, I had uh, six surgeries, and uh, I didn't feel like I was ever going to leave that hospital. I felt that uh, this was going to be the uh, termination of my ministry, termination of my life. And um, 
doctor came in and uh, he said, uh, we've done all we can do, that there's nothing more we can do but turn it over to uh, your body and let your body work on it. I wasn't comfortable with that and so I, I started praying. The room got very quiet, very still, and the head nurse came in. She had been um, in to see me every 15 to 20 minutes, and uh, she stood alongside of me. And she said, I can remember her words so clearly, she said, just relax. She said, I know everything will be all right. And she put her hand on my uh, right arm and began to stroke it. And she said, you will be okay. We're in control of what's happening to you. And I began to feel warm. A sense of uh, wholeness came over me. And I didn't hear any, any other voices other than hers who was saying and reassuring me that everything was going to be all right. And uh, after a period of, I don't know how long, it was a very short time, she said, I'm going to go call the doctor. I want the doctor to come in and look at you. And so the doctor came in and, and he said, I don't know what's happened, but he said, you've made a sudden turn. And he said, I think you've passed the crisis. And I said, well, I knew that too. And he said, how did you know that? And I said, because the angel touched me. And he said, he laughed and he said, what do you mean? I said, no, the angel who was present in my room touched me. And that made all the difference. It was the nurse who had touched me. And after I began to feel stronger, and she, I told her what had happened. And she said, you mean you thought I was an angel? And I said, no, I knew you were an angel. And that God was working through you to bring me back from wherever I was headed. And she was kind of overwhelmed by it all. And she said, I never had this experience before. And I said, well, I can assure you, I never have either. <laughs> uh, but I said, I believe very strongly that you are God's angel for me. And I will forever thank you for what you've done. An angel speaks, a human listens and responds. Maybe we should all learn to listen more carefully to these messengers of God. But what about those other messages? Those sudden inclinations to do something bad? We can't escape the truth. The presence of evil seems to be alive and well across the face of the earth. Just where are the good angels in all of this? People wonder if there are indeed angels who are here protecting us. Why then do we have such, such things as children who starve to death and events like the Holocaust? How could these things happen when angels are supposed to protect us and to watch over us? I'd like to, to remind us of something very simple and that, that is that this is a, an evil that human beings inflict upon one another. So I guess when we ask that kind of a question, what we're doing in a sense is we're making a judgment about God. You know, what kind of a God would permit this kind of thing to happen? And in this case, you're asking also the question about angels. How could angels permit this to be? And yet, I wonder if in the long run, we ourselves as humans will not also have to face that same judgment. How could we as human beings let these kinds of things uh, be happening in our world? What if nothing bad ever happened? What if everything was perfect? Uh, there was never any bad people, no negativity. Um, everybody had just enough money. No crimes happened. Everything would be handed to you, you wouldn't learn anything. Nobody would learn anything. You wouldn't have to work for anything. And I believe that that's why we're here, is just it's simply a stopping point for a school, if you will. <laughs> and um, sometimes bad things have to happen, but 
there will, something good will come out of that. We are here to love one another and to learn the ways of peace. If, if God were to intervene directly, say, to directly send an angel to put food into a child's mouth, that is not teaching us that we have a responsibility to that child. If that child is to be fed, it's to come from our hands. Angels don't want the attention on them. They want us focused beyond them. They're pointing to heaven and they're disappearing. They're saying that's where the peace is coming from. That's where you have to start. So you've got to put God back and then everything else will make sense and everything else will flow from that. So, angels aren't looking for praise or adoration. Some remarkable insights on this subject are offered by Betty Eady, whose book Embraced by the Light is a bestseller. Betty wrote the book following an extensive near-death experience where she picked up some definite opinions about an angel's place in human affairs. But don't focus on angels. If you focus on angels, you are shortchanging yourself. Many people have come up to me and they said, Betty, I want to learn how to get in contact with my angels. Why? Why do you want to learn who the messenger is? Learn who God is. I don't even know who my angels are. I don't remember their names. I don't try to know what their names are. I just know that they're there. I want my relationship to be pure and anything that you put between you and God will put a distance, a space. Don't put angels there. So again, angels seem to be God's messengers, a link offered between heaven and earth, as they've always been. As in the great stories of the past, Many believe that angels continue to play an important role in our world's unfolding. Chances are that there are, are members of your immediate family circle who have had these experiences, uh, friends, un undoubtedly people at the workplace if you have a, an office of any size at all. Uh, but they're out there, you just don't know it because people are reluctant to, um, to tell these stories out in public for fear of ridicule. Now we're opening up to an era where potentially we won't have to depend on the belief-disbelief thing anymore, that now that we can talk openly about our spiritual experiences. It helped me a great deal to talk to other people and share with them what had happened to us, and they would say, you know, it's all right. You know, we've, we've had a similar experience. You're, you're not crazy. I can remember how I felt when I first began to seriously entertain the idea that a spiritual realm exists. Because I had been an agnostic. I thought the physical was all there was. I thought the universe was just a big, cold, dead, random machine that came into being by accident. We're just little cogs, and it doesn't make any difference what happens, what we do. You know, we're here for a few brief moments on the stage, and then we make our exit into oblivion. And suddenly I began coming across circumstantial evidence, not scientific proof, but circumstantial evidence that that was not the case, that we live in a universe of purpose, a universe of intelligence, and a universe that seems, appears to have been planned by an unseen hand. This is more than just a subject to dwell on and pass on. Because if, if, this, is, if this is true, if angels really do exist and a spiritual realm exists and we have a purpose and a plan, that says something to us. Faith, that all sums it up. Without that, you can't get anywhere. Being able to yield myself to the governing of God is the empowerment that an angelic presence gives to me. To be able to believe that God is so concerned about me and you and all of us that God comes presently into each of our lives. And it w if we're open enough to receive that presence, then we become so much more open to each other. And it's that angelic presence that binds us into one another's lives. And we're whole and at peace. And might the angel's final and finest message be, you are not alone. No matter where you travel, 
or where you end your days. Could it be that an angel hovers ever near, ever offering the great peace that comes with believing?